baik Thank you, Trevor. First of all, apologies if the voice uh, is uh, worse than usual tonight. I'm on the back end of a cold. But in this 22nd chapter, in the first five verses, we have a continuation of what we had in the 21st chapter with a description of that glorious city, which of course is describing the Lamb's wife. And then from verse 6 to the end of the chapter, we have the final exhortations from the Lord Jesus Christ as he concludes this wonderful apocalypse. So picking up the theme from last time, from the 21st chapter, what we are considering in verses 1 to 5 are things spiritual. But like we saw through the 21st chapter, they are based upon things which are natural. But they are not relating to natural things but they are using the natural to build up the spiritual principle. For example, you'll see in the first verse of chapter 22 that John saw a river of water of life proceed out of the Lamb of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life which bore twelve manner of fruits, yielded her fruits every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now if you come back to the 47th chapter of the prophecy of Ezekiel, in the literal house of prayer for all nations, which will be established during the kingdom age, Ezekiel sees an almost identical situation to what we have just read. Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 1. And he brought me again into the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. And Ezekiel was given the passage of this water as it came from under the altar and went out of the city. And he found as he went down it that the water got deeper and deeper to the point that in verse 5 afterward he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were written, risen waters to swim in a river that could not be passed over so in this literal temple that will be erected upon the mountain of Israel John sees from under the altar waters issue forth which grow in size until they become a river and you'll notice in verse 6 that he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees, on the one side and upon the other. Then he said unto me in verse 8, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which bring forth which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And so, as this waters became a river, on either side of the river, Ezekiel saw various trees. Now if you come again, down to verse 12, <coughs> by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fail, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed, it shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. And if you've got a margin of the authorised Oxford version, you will notice that for medicine you've got or for bruises or sores. And so the leaves of the trees are going to be used for the healing of the nations. The fruit is going to be used for meat and the leaves for healing. Now, what we have got literally in chapter 2 of 22 of the Apocalypse, we've got on a spiritual basis. Because what is still being described, going back to chapter 21 and in verse 9, is the Lamb's wife. And right the way through the 21st chapter, the Apocalypse is built upon that which was natural and what will be literal in Ezekiel's temple, 
and considering the spiritual application. And this again I believe, brothers and sisters, it's what's being shown in the opening couple of verses of chapter 22. As there will be literal water issuing out from under the altar, which will spread and grow into a river, and upon either side will be the trees, they will bear leaves and fruit, and the leaves will be for the literal healing of the diseases of the nations, according to Ezekiel 47. So we take that and apply it spiritually to what is being described in these verses. So what would we to understand by a pure river of water of life in verse 1? You'll notice it is clear as crystal and it proceeds not from the altar as chapter 47 in Ezekiel does but out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. The pure river of water of life. But perhaps we can go to John chapter 7 and get an obvious answer to the spiritual application of what Ezekiel saw in chapter 47. And I'm sure you all recall the words of John chapter 7. In verse 37, John 7 verse 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So as we speak of the word as the water of the word of life, which was given to us by the Spirit of God, so the Master in verse 38 speaks of those rivers of living water which would flow from him and would descend upon those who believe on him. And of course the initial application of John chapter 7 was on the day of Pentecost, when the river of living water, the Spirit of which he spake, descended upon the apostles and they with that clear as crystal water of life i.e. the spirit was able to offer something which would heal the nations on a far more permanent basis than any medicines or any leaves as they will literally in the age to come because the apostles were offered were able to offer the salvation of the gospel message and the spirit was given them to assist in the preaching of that word as the spirit word is given to us today to assist us in the preaching of that word in order that people might see the great salvation which is offered in the gospel and therefore coming back to the 22nd chapter of the apocalypse as with the day of Pentecost so more so in the kingdom age the same community who obviously are totally spiritual by this stage upon which the, the, the spirit of immortality has been poured out they with this power of the almighty will proceed out of the throne of God and of the Lamb and I believe this thought is continued in verse 2 in the midst of the street and don't forget we saw the street going back to verse 21 of chapter 21 the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. The whole of it is speaking in different aspects of the same community. Upon either side of the river was there the tree of life. Now, it cannot be, literally, that you can have one tree on either side of the river. That's what verse 2 seems to indicate. That in the midst of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Now you couldn't have one tree in the midst of the street and on either side of the river. Now some have interpreted the Greek word for tree as it is in verse 2 as zulon, x-u-l-o-n in the Greek, which can be translated wood or forest 
and therefore they assume that there is a multiplicity of trees being mentioned and therefore they say that's why in the rest of verse 2 it yields 12 manner of fruits and yields her fruit every month and therefore there is many trees I don't necessarily brothers and sisters think that's what it's saying what it's drawing our attention to is something which cannot be from a literal point of view. We are speaking spiritually. And therefore, though naturally, it's impossible for one single tree to be on either side of the river. That which is being representative can permeate anywhere because it's speaking of the tree of life. It's speaking of the tree of life. Now, of course, we could go back to Genesis, and we know what the tree of life represented, represented in the Garden of Eden. We know why Adam and Eve were forbidden, prohibited, from partaking of that tree of life after they had sinned. Because it was not right for sin to be perpetuated by that tree of life and therefore the cherubim were placed at the east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life but when we came to the seven letters to the seven ecclesias in Asia we find that access was given to the tree of life to those who overcome and the tree of life was to stand for everlasting life for perpetuating life everlasting. Now if you think of it in the context of what chapter 22 is saying that on the either side of the, the river this river which was spiritual were the tree of life and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation now can we just do one or two little exercises can we go back to the book of Psalms and to a chapter, the very first one which we only read a few days ago Psalm 1 and the psalmist in the opening verse says blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of Yahweh and in his law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper now the psalmist is not speaking of a literal tree he is speaking of that which is there for those who walk not in the counsel of the ungodly or in the way of the sinners to obtain to they're going to be as upright as the trees who have drank deeply of the water of the word who have been given that spiritual nature in order for their leaves never to wither but they are evergreen they are totally undying they will continue forever and therefore they are trees of life and that is the promise of all those who, as verse 1 would say, have abstained from the worldliness around them and have delighted in the law of God. And to those is the blessing that they may be not only partakers of the tree of life, but might become in themselves, as verse 3 says, trees of life. Now again, we've got many other passages in the scriptures, but let's just go to Isaiah 61. <coughs> there are many symbologies of the saints in glory as trees and Isaiah 61 is a beautiful one indeed now notice again the opening words of verse 1 the spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me and we know the master quotes these in Luke chapter 4 we also know that he stops halfway through the quotation but the principle is the spirit was upon him why? because Yahweh hath anointed me 
hath anointed me with the Spirit to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh. It was at that point the Master concludes. But if we read on, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, why? That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he might be glorified. Now the Master quotes that in the context that the Spirit of God had anointed him that through the preaching of the glad tidings of the Gospel all those who were ill and sick not from any natural point of view but that which has beset them from Adam the curse of mankind might indeed be able to come through to the point that instead of mourning there would be joy instead of ashes there would be beauty that they might be trees of righteousness. Now, we all appreciate the Master's application of that as far as we are concerned. And it's significant that the Master, quoting Isaiah 61, says that those who accept this gospel message in truth will become trees of righteousness. In other words, he will heal all their diseases through the preaching of that gospel of which the Spirit of God had anointed him to preach. Now what the Master, God willing, is doing for us, during the Kingdom Age, we will do for the mortal population of the Kingdom, that through the anointing of us with the Spirit, we as trees of righteousness, will be able to preach that word, so that, as it were, the leaves of the trees, the individual actions of the saints, through the preaching of that word, will save the world from their ills. And I believe that is exactly what the 22nd chapter of the Apocalypse is speaking about. It's speaking of the fact that in verse 2, we will become the trees of righteousness. We will be the tree of life to emanate throughout the world so that others might partake of the fruit and the leaves i.e. the things that we are offering to them in the good things of the gospel message in order for them to be healed and the eventual consequence as we have seen at the end of this vision that it is a accumulating process first at the first advent uh, at the first resurrection and then second at the, the second resurrection when in verse 3 of chapter 22 there shall be no more curse and although I'm not a horticulturist by any means from what I remember of my biology lessons at school trees took in the impurities in the earth's atmosphere the carbon dioxide and gave out pure oxygen to refresh the air of this world now if you take that as a literal, natural happening, the saints, through their actions, as trees of righteousness, will take in all the ills of the world and will purify the millennial air of that time in order for the world to become a much better place for people to live and move and have their being. And so the aspect of the saints of trees and righteousness will cleanse this world as, left to its own, the trees of this world and the plants of this world would purify the air which we breathe. So we can apply the natural to the spiritual level and see the effect of the same community throughout the earth until there will be no more earth, no more curse. And everybody upon this earth will be totally spiritual having all been anointed of that spirit water of life which proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And so in verse 3 of chapter 22 there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it 
and his servants shall serve him. And it's that glorious time when God will be all in all. Then we have that glorious picture that the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there seems to be a twofold aspect to verse 4. It's the Father's name which is written in the foreheads. Chapter 14 and verse 1 tells us that. And as we shall see, first of all, the face of the Lord Jesus, we will then, as it were, at the end of the millennium, when God is all in all, see the face of him. He that has seen me, says the Master, has seen the Father. And so we see, shall see first the face of the Almighty revealed in Christ Jesus until we shall see him all and in all. And I suppose we've all got our own favourite scriptures in this respect, brothers and sisters. But there's two which I particularly like. The first one is in Isaiah 33. It obviously relates to when we shall see the Master. And I suppose in our inner conscience, we've all got our own picture of the Master and what our reaction will be when we shall see him. But I believe Isaiah 34 seems to capture the spirit of the occasion when we shall see him for the first time. Verse 17, Isaiah 33, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. I always feel that those words of that opening phrase that our eyes will see the king in his beauty. They shall see his face. And I always feel so humble, brothers and sisters, when you contemplate that we mortals will have the privilege of casting our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ and God willing, according to his mercy, at the end of the millennium, will see him who is all and in all. And again, if we can come back to the Song of Solomon, the second scripture which always springs to mind is the one in Song of Solomon. And it's in chapter 5. And it's the way that the bride describes her beloved. And if we can try and just capture the spirit of the words of the wise man in verse 9 and onwards of chapter 5 and it's all to do with this and they shall see his face what is thy beloved more than any other beloved O thou fairest among women what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us my beloved is white and ruddy the chiefest among ten thousand his head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the reservoirs of waters, washed with milk and fitly scent. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with a beryl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble, set upon the rock sockets of the gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and then, to sum it all up, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And we, God willing, brothers and sisters, speaking through the wise men, look upon him in this way, when our eyes shall see the king in his glory. He is altogether lovely. And according to God's mercy, we will very shortly, I believe, be privileged to see him, who is this altogether lovely one, when our eyes will fix upon him, who has wrought salvation for each one of us. And again, if we've been accounted worthy, he will give unto us that anointing spirit, that power 
divine and we with him will saturate this world with righteousness and peace to the end that there will be no more curse and when the father tabernacles with men we shall see his face those whose name his name is written in their foreheads and so coming back to the 22nd chapter and verse 5 there shall be no night there they need no candle neither light of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever there will be no need at that time it will be pure divine light radiating throughout this world and words almost fail to describe brothers and sisters the beauty and the wonder of that time we see through a glass darkly and we can only have pen pictures of the kingdom and the finite mind has difficult to grasp even what the kingdom is going to be like and yet during the kingdom there will still be death there will still be crying there will still be sorrowing and sighing but now we've come to this end of time when there is no curse when the father and the son and the saints in glory are all of one and they shall reign with him forever and ever and throughout the 21st and even in these opening verses of the 22nd chapter it's impossible in my humble opinion to get to the depth of what John saw because he's describing a situation which is certainly beyond my powers of comprehension of the glory and the wonder of that time when all things are perfect when divine light and divine glory radiates through this earth when there is no more death when sighing and crying have passed away and we shall see not only the sun who we've had the privilege of reigning with for the kingdom age and of that little season but also we shall see the father the one who has caused all things to happen and they shall reign forever and ever and John no doubt in all of these things says in verse 6 and he said unto me these sayings are faithful and true and the Lord God of the holy prophets send his angels to show unto his servants the things which shortly must be done and we can imagine brothers and sisters because as we've traversed the apocalypse over four years plus and we've gone through some very difficult historical periods even for us to be able to understand we have tried to create the atmosphere of what it must have been like for our brethren and sisters who were suffering such great persecution at the hands of various powers as they've come and gone in the purpose of the Almighty but how must our brethren and sisters have felt when they had read through this apocalypse and they had seen their own time and they had experienced what was to come hereafter and they had come to the 20th, the 21st and now these 22nd chapter and they had seen the final outcome they had seen the end and the realization of all their hopes and aspirations and they received these blessings that everything that they had read everything that had been revealed in the apocalypse was faithful and true and God hath revealed them by his angel to his servants to show unto them the things which must shortly be done and although we through hindsight have seen that things have taken 2,000 years to actually work out to the brethren and sisters of the time of the age and generation who were living whenever it might have been always had that vision of the kingdom interspersed in the book of the apocalypse to give them that hope to hold fast to the faith to the end and I'm sure many a tear had been shed by our brethren and sisters as they read the climax of all things when God said that he is in control and that he is bringing everything to pass according to his will and the apocalypse has been given so that his servants might know 
the things that have been revealed. And it breaks my heart, brothers and sisters, when brethren want to take the apocalypse, destroy 2,000 years of history, and put it all to the future, and ignore the pleadings of our brethren and sisters down the ages. The encouragement the apocalypse must have given them as they were struggling under desperate circumstances to hold fast to the truth. And God has revealed that these things would shortly happen and the kingdom would come and their hope would be realised. These sayings are faithful and true. And it's very significant that from verse 6 onwards now, as the Master gives his final exhortation to his servants, how a lot of the phrases we have covered in the Apocalypse are repeated. For example, that faithful and true. Can we come back to chapter 3? And we shall see as we go through, and you'll spot them for yourselves, how often phrases are repeated, as if the Master is drawing together the whole of the Apocalypse into his final exhortation. We come to chapter 3, and we come to verse 14, when he is speaking to the ecclesia of the Laodiceans. And he says in verse 14, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And it was the revelation of Jesus Christ, the faithful and true witness. And therefore, in, John, in verse 6 of chapter 22, John says the sayings are faithful and true because the sayings came from the Master who is faithful and true. And the Lord God revealed it to the Master who revealed it uh, through his angel to his servant John to show unto him the things which must shortly be done. But have you noticed also the use in verse 6 to show unto his servants the things which shortly must be done? And that's how we open the Apocalypse in chapter 1 and in verse 1. A comment which we have referred to so many times that the Apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, was to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. It was not given to the world, it was not given to natural Israel. It's been given unto the servants of Christ in order for them to understand the things which must shortly come to pass. And I believe it's significant in this 22nd chapter that not only is the phrase servants revived in verse 6, but it also draws attention to what we saw in verse 3. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And it appeals to me, brothers and sisters, that he is making reference that the servants who can strive to understand the book of the Apocalypse and to apply the principles in their daily lives to his honour and glory, he will cause his servants to serve him forever and ever which takes us back to chapter 1 and verse 3 with that blessing which was there right at the beginning blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand and those of verse 3 are the servants the servants down the ages of time since the apocalypse was given who have striven to understand many difficulties, many problems in the book but they have seen the purpose of God being outworked in the various nations which have come and gone in order for that purpose to come to a great climax when the kingdom is established and then at the end when God is all in all and his servants who have strived in their daily life to appreciate this purpose and to live out that purpose in their lives which is desperately important that they have sought to honour him have caused to be those servants who would serve him forever and ever and so there is this wonderful blessing to the servants of God who strive to understand these things 
And perhaps verse 7 of chapter 22 endorses these things. Behold, he says, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come as a thief, he says. Behold, he says, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And the obvious statement to be made, brothers and sisters, is how can the sayings of the prophecy of the book be kept if they're not understood? How is it possible to do what the Lord commands us in verse 7 on the basis that he is coming quickly, on the basis of verse 12, that I come quickly and the reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be, and part of that work of verse 7 is a commandment from him that blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. How is it possible for the sayings of the prophecies to be kept, to be observed, to be understood, to be lived out in our lives unless we appreciate what those sayings are? And therefore the blessing of chapter 1 and verse 3 goes through the whole of the book, the whole of the 22nd chapter, and comes now down to one of the exhortations, the final exhortations of the Master. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of the book. It's the encouragement, brethren and sisters, to the faithful, to the servants in all ages to wrestle with and to understand not necessarily in great detail, not necessarily that we shall remember what emperor came and which emperor went and what barbaric tribe overtook another one, but that we may understand whatever generation that we have been living in, the hand of the almighty work, that God rules in the kingdoms of men and is giving us the opportunity to understand the outworking of this purpose and he has given us that glorious hope of the gospel message that we may so order our lives now that he might glorify them for the future. And therefore, as far as we are concerned, coming back to the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse, and we see now in our generation, as past brethren and sisters in chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 11 and chapter 13 have seen their particular niche in history, so we now, in these last days, See in verse 13, the three unclean spirits like frogs go out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, unto the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And we're there, brothers and sisters, as we know. We're in the midst of the outworking of verse 14 as the spirits of the demons are working the earth today to bring about that battle of that great day of God Almighty. And there's not a day goes by when some news item or something we read in the newspaper shows to us time and time again that the purpose of the Almighty is being worked out in the earth to the point of verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. And as we, brothers and sisters, in our niche, in the outworking of the purpose of God, can see from the 16th chapter, the days are short. The Master will soon be here. So the exhortation from him to us, in chapter 22 and verse 7, is, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Blessed is he that keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see shame. And each one of us, brethren and sisters, through the Apocalypse and through our other reading of the Word, know how vital it is in this dying generation to order our lives acceptable in his sight. Because what is the day in which we live compared to the glory which shall be revealed? The sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared to that which shall be revealed, but unfortunately, at times, we allow the things of this present life 
to cloud our vision, to make things seem more permanent than they are. And we lose sight at times of the way that we should be living, of the principles that we should be upholding in our lives. We fail to keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And therefore how vital it is for us to meet as often as we can, as we can have fellowship one with another to encourage each other on our walk to the kingdom. And I'm sure there's not one of us here, no genuine brothers and sisters, wherever they might be, can fail to understand verse 8 of Revelation 22. When John says, when he saw these things and heard them, and when I heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And I don't believe this was a humility in any sense of the term. This was a genuine response from the Apostle John as he was overawed by not only the glories that, that had been revealed, but that he had been chosen as one of those servants to have these things revealed under him. And I just wonder, brothers and sisters, you know, during mostly the month of December, when the apocalypse becomes part of our daily readings again. I wonder if the awe of the events of the apocalypse as they were unfolded day by day, chapter by chapter, had the same effect upon us as it did upon the Apostle John. Over four and a half year, or wherever it has been, study, we can sometimes lose the overall picture because of the nitty gritty. But in a few days, as it were, we read through the, 22nd, the 22 chapters of the Apocalypse. And I wonder if at the end of it, brothers and sisters, particularly at the time of the year when we're reading them, when the whole world is engulfed in their own practices, I wonder whether the circumstances, whether the visions, whether the sayings of this book cause us to want to fall down and worship him who revealed these things. And of course, John fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. And we've seen this come back to the uh, previous chapters when John again, in chapter 19, wanted to fall down to worship him who had revealed these things to him. Chapter 19 and verse 10. I fell at his feast to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am of thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And again, the angel, who as we have seen throughout the apocalypse, is representative of the saint community, says in verse 9, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And again, much speculation has been, well, he is saying he is one of the prophets. So was it the prophet Elijah? Was it the prophet Enoch? Which of the prophets was it? I don't think it's saying that at all, brethren and sisters. John wanted to worship at the feet of the angel which had showed him these things. And we have seen the angel occur chapter after chapter after chapter. And that angel is the representative man of all the saint community. So John, in effect, by falling down to worship the angel, was worshipping himself as part of that same community. And none of us, brothers and sisters, are in that position. There is only one to be worshipped, that is the Almighty. And therefore, this representative man said, worship God, and our worship should be directed in that way. We are helped, we are very thankful that we are helped by brethren, and by sisters on our way to the kingdom. And no doubt John felt overawed by the revelation of these things by this representative man. But nevertheless, however much we are helped, whether it be in exposition, in books, in word, or in deed, whether it be kindness, or in whatever way, we are helped along our walk to the kingdom we should never extol the virtues of brethren and sisters to the point of putting them on that platform. We should never exalt people in our minds. It is the Father who in his mercy has provided these brethren and sisters to help us. And we are thankful. And at times we want to perhaps express it 
like the Apostle John. And at times we feel so inferior ourselves compared to these stalwarts in the truth. And you sometimes hear, and in one sense rightly so, when an old brother or an old sister falls asleep and they have been the backbone of that particular ecclesia for many a long year and they speak of one of the pillars as now gone. And in one sense, brothers and sisters, that may be so. But Moses was a pillar and yet Joshua took Israel into the land. Joshua himself was a pillar. David was a pillar. All these brethren and sisters like the Marthas and the Marys have been pillars in their own right in that great temple which God is building of brethren and sisters. But the truth has always continued. And on many occasions, brethren and sisters, Israel told never to mourn because the truth will always continue. And therefore, although we mourn the loss of these brethren and sisters who help us on our walk to the kingdom, we must always appreciate that they, without us, will not be made perfect. And therefore the great blessing of the Father is not to feel inferior, but by no means to feel superior to any. We're all part of the same community in prospect. And in Christ Jesus, we're all equal. There is no male, there is no female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And therefore every part of that body is independent and yet dependent upon the other and therefore we all need each other as to help each other to walk to the kingdom but John was being told and shown that we don't feel inferior to any we all collectively worship God from whom all these blessings have flown and therefore we appreciate brothers and sisters the fellowship which the truth brings to each one of us. We all need the encouragement which each one of us can give. Sometimes a word in season, sometimes a greater act, but all vital on our walk towards the kingdom. But never, never feel inferior to anyone. We're all part of God's creation as he builds the spiritual temple to his honour and to his glory. And I believe that is the sense of what John was being given in verse 9. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. I am there to help you, John, as you are to help me, as we are held to each other. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. The book is to be understood. It's in contrast to what Daniel received in his 12th chapter when he was told to seal up for that time the sayings of this book. At the appropriate time, as Habakkuk said in his second chapter, the vision would speak, it would not lie. And the apocalypse is here, brothers and sisters, in the scriptures of truth, to be understood. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. And then we have in verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And at first reading, brothers and sisters, we might wonder, in these final words of exhortation from the Master, why should we have a phrase and sayings like in verse 11? He that is unjust, let him remain so. He that is filthy, let him be in that state. He that is righteous, let him be righteous. And holy, let him be holy. I believe it all hinges on verse 12. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. If we can come to the second of Corinthians chapter 5, a chapter in the verse which we have looked at 
on a number of occasions in the script in, in the study of the apocalypse you remember what the apostle says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad and it's not one moment of time the master is not dealing with us on a split second time he's looking at our life and he's assessing our life at the time when he says behold I come quickly and my reward is to give to every man and woman according as their work shall be the things they have done in the body according to what they have done whether it be good or bad and it's not my assessment of your life or yours of mine brethren and sisters it's what the master assesses of our life whether he feels we have kept the sayings of this book whether he feels we have attempted to overcome as the ecclesia were exhorted in chapters 2 and 3 whether we brethren and sisters are reflecting in whatever frail and small way it might be that image of himself which he finds acceptable unto him and at the point when he returns it's like as we've just read as far as Noah was concerned it was Yahweh who shut the door of the ark and nobody else could go in it was too late they could bang and they could shout and they could scream it wasn't Noah who was shutting people out it was the Almighty and when the day comes when the Master returns to this earth and we are called to stand before him in judgment then he that is unjust according to the things that he hath done in his body will be unjust still there will be no miraculous wiping of the slate there will be no deathbed confession the master is reiterating the things which we have seen throughout the apocalypse he knows our frame he remembers that we are dust there is not one of us worthy of these great and high things to which we have been called but it's the attitude the disposition of our lives the way we have gone about to attempt to the very best of our ability to live out the life which we know we should be doing and let's not kill ourselves brothers and sisters there's not one of us who doesn't know what we should be doing the problem is we want to try and say well it doesn't matter if I do that as well we want to try and con ourselves and delude ourselves and to justify that the things that we do in our lives are really okay and because they are acceptable very much so more often than not to our brethren and sisters then we feel quite confident that the things that we are doing are good and therefore the apostle says every time we look at that bread and the wine let a man and a woman examine themselves to see whether or not they be of the faith when they consider Sunday by Sunday the great price that has been paid for their redemption let them examine their lives and look at their lives honestly not through their own eyes but through his and therefore not one of us at the end of the day can obtain unto the kingdom on anything that we have done but we know the circumstances of the life which he requires of us and he according to his mercy has promised that he will make up our deficiency that without the forgiveness of sins none of us can possibly attain to that kingdom but there must be an effort and an attempt on our part brothers and sisters otherwise what's the purpose of verse 7 why does the master add a blessing to those that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book if it's unimportant what we do in our lives if our son would have us believe that whatever we do whatever life we live if we plead for forgiveness he will forgive how do we equate that with verse 7 there is certainly a need of forgiveness and each one of us acknowledges that only too much but nevertheless brothers and sisters 
the master in verse 12 is saying that he's going to reward us according as our work shall be and the person that is unjust will remain unjust and therefore unacceptable the person that is filthy let him remain filthy still he also is unacceptable but he that is righteous or he that is holy not in our own stance because none of us could declare ourselves righteous or holy but as Paul explained in Romans 5 that we have been justified by faith and the word justified means to be made righteous as we know and therefore through faith in his blood according to his mercy and according to the effort that we have made in our lives then at that time he will reward everyone according as his work shall be and will bid the righteous and the holy into life everlasting it's interesting in verse 11 the word filthy can I take you back to James 2 because in the epistle of James and the second chapter the word filthy is translated exactly the same word is ex ex it's translated in James 2 and verse 2 at the end of the verse as vile raiment if they come into your assemble a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel and they come in also a poor man in vile raiment that phrase vile raiment is the same Greek word which has been translated in Apocalypse 22 and verse 11 as filthy and therefore to me there's an implication with the vile garment as the filthy garment and in baptism, we have been covered, clothed with a garment. And the exhortation of James, as we know, pure religion and undefiled, is he that visits the fatherless and the widows and keeps himself unspotted from the world. And the idea of it is that we can stain those garments of righteousness. And we can stain those garments of righteousness by the worldliness which enters into our lives and causes the righteous garment to be stained with the evil and the wickedness of this world and there is the point in verse 11 that he that is unjust and the idea is those who have remained unjust in other words unjustified and therefore have never accepted the true principles of faith of Romans chapter 5 but there is also the state where those who perhaps at one stage were covered with those garments of righteousness have allowed them to be stained and they have become therefore filthy garments and therefore at the time when the master returns and rewards every man according to his works then they will remain filthy still and will be rejected at his hand and therefore it would seem that verse 11 is linked to verse 12 and it's in view of verse 12 that this will be the outcome of the judgment and it is appropriate that it appears at this time when he is exhorting finally his brethren and sisters to hold fast to the faith because he says in verse 13 we'll pick this point up next time I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end the first and the last and I believe the stress there in verse 13 is for a very beautiful reason but we'll pick up the point next time.